It was one of the most important moments in America's history. And we sent America's greatest scholar, intellect, philosopher, scientist that we had available. We sent this person to who was at the time our most crucial ally. We had to get this just right. And freaking Benjamin Franklin showed up in Paris wearing that fur cap <laughs> on his head. And I can only imagine his wife was wondering whether or not he should leave the house like that. This is clearly not a good idea, Ben. No, no, it'll be great, trust me. Now, hat wearing, of course, was a real statement of your personality, of who you were as a person. But even back then, this cap was a little much. But not surprisingly, the Parisians loved it. And when I mean that the Parisians loved this fur cap, I mean that they wrote poems about the hat. <laughs> they had engraved souvenirs that featured Ben Franklin and his fur cap that were adorning almost every house throughout France. They loved this hat. And one of the reasons why they did is because for them, this hat represented the spirit of the frontiersman. This was in what philosopher Rousseau would call really exemplified the natural man. You see, France had been dealing with generations of oppressive monarchies, and they believed that they needed to get back to a stage in which man and woman were unhindered by the oppression that they had felt, and they felt like this hat in some way emphasized all of that. But to me, this hat signals the moment in which France and the rest of the world would never treat America as a serious intellectual force. <laughs> Even our smartest man was sort of considered to be somewhat of a hillbilly, a, a frontiersman, and we became the country of the cowboy, we became the country of the heroic idiot. But of course, Ben Franklin was no idiot, not really. It was all posturing, it was brilliant marketing because Americans seem to have a thing for stupid hats and playing the fool. In fact, humorists like Mark Twain and Washington Irving often played the fool. They would sometimes cast aside their brainy upbringings in order to play the role of the simpleton. And this was a very American approach to it. And so Ben Franklin, I mean, he was born in Boston. He lived in Philadelphia. This was not a man who was raised by wolves in the wilderness. But you see, we love stories about people who dropped out of school, who never completed their education, and who went on to accomplish great things. We are seduced by myths of those people who underperformed in their youth and then went on to become our boss. We have story after story of people who dropped out of this, who left that, who gave up on this, and moved into their garage and started Microsoft or Apple, or name it. I mean, and these stories become apocryphal at a certain point. We're not even really sure what's true anymore. Just if someone was great, we assumed at some point they dropped out of high school. <laughs> and while this is really entertaining for us, I was a teacher for 12 years, and I promise you, every year I had at least one or two students who dropped out of school, not because they weren't talented, not because they weren't capable, but because they felt like greater things were on the horizon and they could not sit through another one of my classes to wait for these great things to happen. So they would leave school, they would drop out. And I know what you're thinking, you're like, and they went on to start amazing companies. No, they did not. <laughs> things went badly for them. And the reason why it went badly for them is because we get so seduced into this myth, the story of Ben Franklin, a person who dropped out of his formal education, and just by his sheer pluck and tenacity accomplished great things. We get so seduced by this story that sometimes we forget a very important part of that element, which is you have to educate yourself. You have to learn things. You have to gather together that intelligence. Um, I'm gonna talk really briefly about my friend, Wim Benz, who um, he, was, he worked for Tracy Locke, uh, worked in marketing, and he left his very comfortable job to start a brewing company, Lakewood Brewing Company, uh, best beer that you can get in Dallas. But here, exactly. But here is the thing about it. Before he left, he got really good at brewing beer. 
He practiced. He tried stuff. He took classes. He enrolled in a school. He was an apprentice to another brewery for quite some time. And it wasn't until he had won some awards and really felt good about what he had done that he actually took that leap and, and dropped out of his job to pursue this great passion. But Americans, we love this idea that somehow we spurn the education, we put on that fur cap, and we become the frontiersmen to achieve these great things. But it sets a terrible precedent. We went from Ben Franklin, who was self-educated through voracious reading, to George W. Bush, who said during a commencement speech at SMU, and I'm quoting this directly, to those of you who are graduating this afternoon with high honors, awards, and recognition, I say, well done. And as I like to tell the C students, you too can become president. <laughs> but here's the thing. I don't want a C student for president. Okay? I want an honors student. I want someone who spent their summer reading the Federalist Papers I want someone who watched C-SPAN congressional floor debates for fun. I want an A-plus political nerd who understands policy, is passionate about law, who dreams of elegant solutions for America. But no, in general, we want folksy wisdom that outwits those civilized folk. We want the fur cap. This archetype is the hero of a broken system. Think Huckleberry Finn, think Bill and Ted, these are the dumb but lucky bastards who beat the odds. Now I should say, I love Ben Franklin. It worked for him, in part because he was just posturing. He was a genius. But the problem is when it's just the fur cap and there's no brain activity happening directly underneath. See, we're living in a country right now where exceptionalism is suspect and idiotic behavior is championed. So what's the appeal? Charles Bukowski once said, the problem with the world is that intelligent people are full of doubts while the stupid ones are full of confidence. And that's the problem. Confidence is inherently a heroic trait. However, confidence is also an inherently idiotic trait. In Marvel Comics, there's a hero named Daredevil. And on the cover of every Daredevil comic, it says, the man without fear, confident. But the thing about being the man without fear is, I'm sorry, the man without fear does not save the day. He gets hit by a car. Okay? I don't want fearless heroes in my life. You know, this is the person, you know, I want, I want a prudent hero. I want someone who does research, who factors in the common good, thinks about long-term consequences of the course of any action. You know, the problem with Gotham City is that Batman is a hero. He spends all day confidently punching people and kicking ass. And he's not thinking about, you know, the progressive actions that rebuild the economy of Gotham. He's not thinking about infrastructure. Batman is not worried about Gotham's public transportation or the education of its citizenry. And you know why? Because no one wants to read a comic book about civic leaders. <laughs> a civic leader who successfully unites a city around its urban core while avoiding the basic pitfalls of gentrification but maybe we need new heroes. The intelligent person solves problems differently than the heroic idiot. Here are four ways that intelligent people approach the world differently. First of all, intelligent people do not simplify problems for expediency's sake. They tackle complex problems. They embrace it. No more of this explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. I'm done with that. Explain it to me like I'm a well-educated individual. Let's start there. Number two, intelligent people do the research. They consider all valid sources and trust data more than their gut. Do the research. Can we just as a group tonight make a promise that we will never again comment on a Facebook post before we read the article entirely? <laughs> that would be a great first start. I think we could call tonight a win if we just started off there. Three, intelligent people understand that today's solution may not work for tomorrow. So instead, they look for sustainable processes that lead to long-term planning. Just because something worked today does not mean it's gonna work 10 years from now. And so instead, we look at what these things can lead to and what the unintended consequences might be. And so we plan for it. 
Four, they understand that true intelligence requires patience and empathy, and it's rooted in deep compassion for a better world. Because now more than ever, this diverse and beautiful world requires more empathy and understanding. The heroic idiot can't be bothered, though. He's too busy kicking ass. But true solutions come from nerdy, educated, detail-oriented people who take time to seek progress. So, our leaders need more than a gimmick, more than a slogan, more than a stupid cap. To this day, smart people have always been wearing the fur cap to make their message palatable to everyone else. But our heroes shouldn't need an idiotic alter ego. Thank you very much.